Oh, oh, oh my goodness. Oh, it's Saturday morning. I look at myself. Look at that beard. I'm that good-looking Howard Kalen, lead singer from the Turtles. And that must mean Saturday morning. It's the Saturday morning jukebox with John and Rick. Hallelujah music that I like. And now it's the Saturday morning jukebox legend spotlight. Welcome back to the Saturday Morning Jukebox. John Russell and Rick Hickman along with you, and we are extremely happy to welcome a gentleman who has added author to his resume of amazing accomplishments, which include vocalist, musician, radio show host, songwriter, and along with longtime friend Mark Volman, a founding member of the Turtles. We welcome into the legend spotlight, Mr. Howard Kalen. Hey, good morning, John. How you doing, Rick? I know your brother. Mick. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, he is. Uh, Oh, Howard, through all the things with which you've challenged yourself during your storied career and all the different elements you've taken on, one of the most successful things you've ever accomplished is clearly your friendship with Mark Volman. How did the two of you first get to become acquainted? It was a weird thing then, and it's a weird thing now, <laughs> boys. It started out, I was in this little high school band, and uh, we had called ourselves the Night Riders because we thought we were all threatening. I think together we <laughs> weighed like 40 pounds. And, uh, and we were uh, this little band that was trying to do kind of Midwest rock and roll, a la Johnny and the Hurricanes, because that was what our lead guitar player knew. Yeah. Plus, he only knew like four chords, and, and that was just about what I could play, kind of four chords honky sax things and that's that's as far as we had gotten in our careers professionally was playing like these little teen dances and getting like fifty dollars a night or something to perform and it really wasn't much of a career but it was an avocation let's say and i was standing next to mark in the acapella choir in uh, school, I think it was just before lunch, if memory serves, and uh, he said, hey, uh, you're in a band, right? And I said, yes, that's right, Night Riders, absolutely, I'm in a band, because it was the only thing that distinguished me from all the rest of the socially inept <laughs> nerds uh, that he was probably referring to, and uh, and he said, uh, gee, I- I'd love to be in it, and I said, well, d- d- that's great, sure, well, what is it you do? And he said, well, nothing, and I said, well, that's fantastic, uh, you know? I'm going to talk to Al, our lead guitar player, about it and see if there's a place for you in our band, because I think, you know, you've got all the qualifications. Nothing is exactly what I do. Uh, And so Al thought it was a good idea, too. Uh, Mind you, we knew uh, kind of who Mark was because he was sort of the class clown, and we thought that by putting him into the band, it would be like commercial or something. So we were no fool looking for our link. And he was sort of it, you know, because he couldn't do anything, didn't stop us from using him. Uh, He was sort of our roadie for the first few shows, and he carried our equipment and fell down the stairs and broke a bunch (laughs) of amplifiers and laughed and laughed. It wasn't his money. What did he care? And then he would drink and drink and drink, and then he would get up on stage and sing all these foul lyrics to What I Say and Money and all these great R&B songs we were trying to do as white teenage kids from California. That alone brought in a crowd of like surfer kids and, and a weird element to see us that we hadn't had before. And we just thought, this is working, you know. It's a good idea to have a clown in your band. You guys putting bands together out there, try to look for a goofy guy because that's the key. You know, that's the key to uh, certainly our success. And it was the key to the Smothers Brothers and Martin and Lewis and anybody else that's got a team going out there. Even the hilarious Lennon and McCartney. There was always a straight man and there was always a clown and of course you guys as a band just continued to hone your craft but then it ain't me babe got things rolling for the turtles in 65 song penned of course by bob dylan how did you end up getting attached to that particular piece of music you know it could have been any song in the world uh we were just looking for a a kind of a folk rock record um we had uh, heard the birds uh, the week before we cut that thing literally in los angeles as a group in hollywood on the sunset strip tambourine men had just come out and we saw the birds play it live and we couldn't afford the kind of instruments they had they had rickenbacker guitars and they were on a big label and stuff and we had no label and then no money and so i think al nickel our lead guitar player went to the guitar store and, and purchased a, a dan Electric 
electro 12 string guitar the next day that cost him like a hundred bucks and uh, we learned tambourine man and a couple of other bird songs and then we learned a bunch of folk songs from our past we had done a little folk singing group thing in our high school and i had written a bunch of folk rocky songs folk songs and then we put them to uh, electric beats and uh, found it ain't me babe on an album a dylan album and thought you know i thought this would be great like a zombie song because it sounded to me like instead of the plaintive song that it really was to my teenage mind like it was an angry song i guess it wasn't but i made it into one you know and, and uh it became sort of a, a zombie-esque kind of sh she's not there song where like colin blundstone i tried to sing the verses softly and in a minor key and then pound the choruses home for for you know in a major key and that's kind of the same thing happy together does it's the same pattern that we followed our entire career we're talking with howard kalin founder of the turtles and his book shell shock my life with the turtles flo eddie and frank zappa and uh, had an opportunity to read that and it's we're kind of gleaning a lot of our questions from uh, about this book we mentioned uh, it ain't me babe and what is it like all of a sudden uh, you're this group and you have this song on the radio and i can only imagine uh, that you guys uh, beside yourself jumping up and down that sort of thing oh my god you cannot believe it you i don't think it's a, an experience that has been matched by uh, by anything that's happened to me since uh, just the first time you hear your song on the radio it is just amazing especially if they're counting it down as part of a survey you know and <laughs> yeah. back in the day that's what they did on radio stations they play your song for a couple of times you'd hear about it other people will have heard it probably not you <laughs> and then uh, somebody puts it on a chart somewhere and says it's getting airplay and the next thing you know somebody's saying, you know, and here's a song that debuted even higher than Bob Dylan's, and you just go, no, 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 it can't be us, it can't <laughs> be us, and they play your song at the age of 17. Wow. We went pretty nuts. We went really nuts, to, to tell you the truth. And uh, we said goodbye to the little teen club we were playing at and uh, and jumped up and down on the stage and goodbye to the Crossfires. That was our name at the time. <laughs> and then the next week we came back and we played the very same club because we didn't have any bookings yet. And uh, the sign said, The Turtles, and we played the same damn song. With the addition <laughs> of Day. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We thought you were going away. We can't miss you. I know. I know. <laughs> Uh, and to, to mention, I, I mean, your love life must have improved like 10 times all of a sudden, right? I mean, all of a sudden. Oh, my friends, my <laughs> advice to you guys who are lonely, you don't have to go to, you know, Christian Mingle. All you need to do is to find yourself a hit record. Day date, forget about it. You know, you need a hit. You just need a hit. And all of a sudden, the girls that wouldn't give you a tumble in front of your locker, you know, five minutes ago are backstage going, please, can I come home with you? Please. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing, you know, and as a dweeb, it's really hard to turn that kind of adoration down, you know, it really is. i got to say, it's difficult. It's a struggle. I don't think I did very well in my struggles. <laughs> <laughs> the, the group, the Turtles itself, as I read this book, uh, Howard, it, it really becomes almost like, Howard and Mark and then, then the other three guys. I'm sure they would say it was the other three guys and Howard and Mark probably, but I mean, was that kind <laughs> of the way... their book. <laughs> <laughs> well, was that kind of how it was? I mean, it was you guys obviously up front and the, and, and the other guys. I mean, there, there, I'm not going to say there seemed to be a lot of friction in that band, but it was almost like, boy, what are these idiots up front going to do next type of thing? Was that kind of the feeling? Yeah, you know, I think you've kind of put your finger right on the pulse of the problem. Uh, and, and whether or not the other three guys wanted to admit it that was an underlying current that sort of stayed with us especially after happy together especially after the ed sullivan shows and stuff when when the only people that they remembered were the guy with the cane and the top hat and the stupid guy with the hair and the glasses those were the guys they remembered and the other clowns and i use the term advisedly although clowns they were mm. kind of faded into the background you know it wasn't on purpose we were a democracy we split everything five ways it wasn't a matter of you know we were paying the guys in the band it wasn't like that at all but that's the way it seemed to them it seemed to them like they were a backup group and uh, 
to many of them, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. Let's talk about uh, the, the song that just gets airplay today. Uh, if you have a classic hit station, which we are, an oldie station, you're gonna, it's going to be a power rotation song, and it's, it's a song called Happy Together. Talk about life-changing songs. Tell us the story behind that, uh, Howard, how that came about, and, uh, and you couldn't foresee that you know, 45, 50 years later, we're still talking about that song, I would imagine. No, who could possibly have foreseen that? I didn't even know it was going to ever make it to vinyl, but I did know it was an incredible song. Uh, Back in the day, uh, we really didn't write a lot of our songs. We got submitted songs by other professional songwriters like Carole King and Jerry Goffin and and the great songwriting teams from the New York City Brill Building era. So we were pleased to find um, in our stack of records a, a song that we thought, here's one that we could actually do and uh, we even were advised at the time no 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 you don't want this song what do you mean we don't want this song why did you put it in the stack well you know it's a worn out thing that's got a lot of crackles and pops in it and may skip a bit why why is that well because it's been around a while what do you mean everybody has turned this song down what do you mean everybody everybody from the grassroots to the vogues to gary lewis and the playboys there isn't a band in america who hasn't heard this song who hasn't gone <laughs> no thanks so we said well anything that infamous has got to be right up our alley let's hear this thing <laughs> and we put on this demo and it was horrible like they said it was crackly and like the shags i mean it was just you couldn't really tell what the hell was going on with the melody it was some guy pounding on his knees instead of a drum it was some guy singing i can't see me love it no it was a guitar guy you couldn't hear it was just what the hell is going on with this thing but but there was something magical about it, just the, the structure of the song, the rhyming pattern of the song. It was just kind of, I don't know, snarky, mm. you know, and it kind of fit our personalities to a T. And so uh, on our own dime, uh, the Turtles decided to fly these songwriter guys, Bonner and Gordon, from New York City into where we live, Los Angeles, California, and put them up at the Beverly Hills Hotel in a $2,500 a night bungalow and hear what this song actually sounded like. Like, we drove there all night, we parked our cars, and we went in to see them, and there they were. It was Bonner and Gordon, and the guy got his guitar, and the other guy sat on the couch, and he started pounding his legs, and the guitar player started playing, and they went, I can't see me, <laughs> And it was worse. It was worse. It was worse than the demo, and it was 3D. It was in our face. It was in person. We didn't know what to say to these guys. It was just like, <laughs> thank you so much. We just went, what the hell are we going to do with this? I don't know but you know this is too good to lose where our instincts have never really been wrong before we had come up with three hit records in the past and then had struggled to find our our next step this we thought would be it so we took the song out on the road and worked it i mean worked it and arranged it vocally and knew what the horns were going to do and knew exactly what it was going to sound like and went back into the studio right after our big summer tour and recorded the thing exactly the way we heard it and when we left the studio we said this is a number one record there's no doubt about it we didn't have any doubts about it whatsoever even though we should have if we were on a tiny little label they couldn't do anything but we knew it. I mean, we just absolutely knew it. And obviously, when you first discussed the song and through all of what seemed like horribleness, could you have ever guessed that it would be picked by BMI, a very respected group, as one of the top 50 songs of the entire 20th century, 5 million radio plays, and continues to live on with movie soundtracks, commercials, and uh, just a life of its own? You know, the best part about this entire thing, you guys... We own it. <laughs> exactly. I mean, not to be, you know, I'm right. just saying because of all the legal battles yeah. that we had to endure uh, during uh, the days that followed our being turtles in, in 1970 on, uh, we fought and we bled tears for this stuff when everybody else thought it would be worthless in the days to come because what are old records going to mean, you know, 20 years from now, like you say? You know, here we are 47 years later talking about this thing. 
thing, but at the time, it seemed like that was a very long-sighted thing to do, and the short money was on getting a couple of grand quick, signing on the dotted line, getting the hell out of Dodge, which is what the other members of the Turtles did, which is why Mark and I wind up being the sole proprietors of the entire catalog and the name, and it's allowed us incredible freedom in the last 30 years. We're talking to Howard Kalen of the Turtles, and while we mentioned that it has to be gratifying that you're so commonly asked to have your music used in commercials and soundtracks. When somebody has an idea like that, does an agency come to you for permission and work out a deal with you and movie makers and people of that sort? Yes, sir, they do. It's really kind of sweet. Uh, we have a music <laughs> administrating, uh, administrating firm in Hollywood that does all that. Uh, they're also the people that listen for samples, just in case somebody gets a, an wow. idea that they want to use. Oh, I don't know, you showed me again, yeah. or, or one of the records that we own to loop around and to make into a new hip-hop hit of the week, and I'm all for it because we get so much money uh, from samples, you can't believe it. And we were the case. We were the court case that defined getting paid for samples. Wow. So I'm proud of it. I wear that badge proudly. Uh, you know, I think it was like 17 years ago that that De La Soul case came to court, and uh, it was a, uh, a record-breaking precedent-setting case uh, wherein we heard uh, that very song you showed me uh, being sampled uh, on an album called Three Feet High and Rising, and uh, they were making an awful lot of money on it, and I don't begrudge them that. Mm -hmm. We just heard our record and said, excuse me, <laughs> shouldn't we get something? And some judge somewhere said, yeah. And the hip-hop community went berserk and really came down on us, you know. Who do these turtle guys think they are? They're trying to stop our urban music. No, no, guys, we're really not. Sure. But if you're driving around in diamond-encrusted grills on your teeth, then I want a piece of the action because that's my song. You know, and since that time, uh, boy, things have been really, really good for us in the hip hop community. All I have to do is whip out my list of, of hip hop cred and I can walk through Compton with head held high. <laughs> As he often does. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> often. I get my best ideas. The book Shell Shack, My Life uh, with the Turtles, Flo and Eddie, and the Frank Zappa, full of, of a million stories. Just if we could indulge you to tell a couple of them, just my favorites from the book are among them. Uh, the bus stories, uh, the cavalcade. Cato stars. You're you're on a on a tour with uh, Tom Jones and I believe it's Peter and Gordon. And you guys yeah. find out pretty quick the the pecking order of just how important this Turtles group is, don't you? You know, we thought we really had it made, man. We were out of high school for about four months, and all of a sudden we're on the road with the Dick Clark Caravan of Stars, and instead of putting us in front with the girls and the dancers and the roadies and all the other people, we get the privilege as soon as we get on the bus of being directed to the very back seats and Mark and I are there with Peter and Gordon and Tom Jones and we're thinking boy life doesn't get any better than this man we are real rockers we've been invited to the back of the bus and it's true and we're sitting and we're talking and we're schmoozing and it's great times and then it gets dark and then they all look at us like well boys you know what to do and we didn't, because we were just out of high school. We thought, you know, uh-oh, is this a sex thing? What the hell? What? Because we didn't know. We really didn't know. And what, what we worked out was eventually that uh, they kind of motioned for us down below, and it wasn't a sex thing at all. It's just that Tom Jones was a pretty big guy, and Gordon Waller was pretty large himself and long and lean and and uh, what the deal was was that when the sun went down it was a regular bus it wasn't a tour bus of any kind it's like a greyhound bus so when the sun went down and it came time to sleep and do an all-night bus ride tom would get the seat and whoever was riding with him on the bus would get the floor under the seat Oh, nice. And the same with me and Gordon Waller. I got the floor under Gordon's seat. And oh. there we were, riding along on the world's bumpiest bus ride overnight. We didn't know what was happening. We didn't have mattresses. We didn't have anything. We just had bumpy, sticky, gummy <laughs> floor with God knows what on it. And there was my face, and there was Mark's face on the seat next to me, looking at me like, what? 
the hell are we going to do now? And this was the way we went through the entire tour. We learned our place very, very quickly. There is a hierarchy to rock and roll. Don't ever think there isn't. <laughs> uh, great story. Another story that I'd like you to, to talk about is you guys go to England, and you happen to uh, go to uh, Graham Nash's house, and lo and behold, it happens to be, I believe, what, the same weekend that the Beatles are releasing Sgt. Pepper, and you guys get a sneak preview of that album, don't you? Our minds are blown forever. Graham pulls out this uh, seven and a half inch IPS tape and uh, puts it on. We think it's going to be the new Hollies album because mm-hmm. we've just met the Hollies in the States and they'd become friends. And we were over at Graham's house. It was night number one in London. And we were all stoked to be there, just out of our mind jazzed. And Donovan was there. And it was, oh my God, everything we wanted London to be. And then this album comes on and we just go, what's happening? And he goes, This is the new one by the Fabs, mates. And no way, no way. Yeah, this is George's copy. He gave it to me. And so we sat and listened to the entire Sgt. Pepper album in the right frame of mind, by the way, (laughs) to Graham and Donovan. (laughs) And could not believe our ears, naturally, as as anybody would. And, And as the last longest note ever played, we looked at each other and went, holy mackerel, what the... And uh, and our rhythm player said, you know, if I ever met those guys, I could die a happy man. And Graham said, well, get your coat, man. Hope your insurance is paid up because wow. here we go. And we went off into the night to this private club called the Speakeasy where we met every luminary in London and uh, and got introduced uh, a la procession style, like he was the queen or something, uh, to John and Paul and uh, and Ringo. George was not there. But all three of those fabs were at a single table in London our first night, and it was just an incredible and quite enlightening experience, actually. Not what I had expected. We were greeted... Uh, friendly enough by uh, uh, Paul and and certainly by Ringo and Paul even knew the songs and and so did John and they all sang Ba Ba Ba's to Happy Together commented on it uh, maybe being a little light in the loafers in a couple of places and I said oh Paul 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 you know we're only trying to be the American version of you you know I was just trying to get in on their kind of idiot humor and it kind of worked and he got it and it was you know nice to get laughs from those guys you know and then, uh, but John would say, well, that's not bloody likely, is it? I mean, you know, uh, right away, right. things like that. But then he started honing in on a rhythm player, Jim Tucker. I mean, really fixating on this guy. And you could tell he smelled blood. And it was kind of, well, it was very sad to watch, actually, uh, especially coming from a guy that I idolized as much as I did John Lennon. Because once he got his teeth into this guy, Jim Tucker, he just wouldn't let go. And he started criticizing his suit and he started criticizing his haircut. You know, <laughs> would you ask your barber for a beetle job? Well, it's not very good, is it? I mean, you give rhythm players a bad name and it's just on and on. And then when he found out his name was Tucker. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he started singing the name game. Yeah. <laughs> and Jim went red because he knew where this was going. Sure. <laughs> and Lennon just didn't stop. And then he actually started crying a, a tear. You know, I didn't even write this part. Tucker really, he lost it. He started crying, and Lennon just went in for the kill and mm. just bam, bam, like Muhammad Ali. It just was not pretty. And Jim finally just said. Uh, well, a bunch of uh, unfortunate words, and then finally, you know, I'm sorry I ever met you, you know, to which Lennon replied, you never did, son. You never did. And Tucker was devastated. He was just devastated. This was his God. And uh, he ran up the stairs. He took a cab back to the hotel. He packed his bag. He went back to the States. He gave up music. He runs a construction company in Grass Valley, California, and he hasn't played music in uh, 40 years. Holy crap, Howard. Three more meetings like that, and you don't have a band. (laughs) You know, that's the best way to get rid of a band I can think of. You know, you mentioned being at Graham Nash's and hearing that tape of Sgt. Pepper. Did you get a sense that maybe music was going to change after that, and the Sonny and the Cher type music, or even maybe what you were doing with the Turtles, might have to evolve itself? Well, yeah, we kind of did. And uh, and that's, you know, we felt that Happy Together had made that leap for us. And uh, and it kind 
kind of had in an international way. It was uh, certainly our, our first hit in England and uh, abroad, uh, and it paved the way uh, for a, a lot more hit records. The record that we put out after that, which I don't think was half as magical as Happy Together, She'd Rather Be With Me, was a much bigger hit in Europe than Happy Together was. And so we kept going over to England and touring on, on the strength of those records. Later on, um, we had even bigger hits. So go figure. I'm grateful. I, I love it. I love going to England still. Mm -hmm. And uh, I haven't been back there in a while except to produce other people's records. But uh, when I do go back to perform, it's one of the few places where they get it. They just get it. There are a few places on this planet that get it, and London is one of them. Amsterdam is one of them. There are certain cities uh, on this planet that just get it. Uh, you guys really were on the, the television circuit. I mean, everything from Hullabaloo to Shindig, certainly the, the, the Ed Sullivan show, and obviously, uh, you know, you were an irreverent group and like to have fun, and that sort of played very, very well on, on television, but you guys were, I gotta think, uh, you know, if you go to YouTube today, the kids can see probably a, a thousand videos of the, of the turtles on different television stations. That was a very active time for you, wasn't it? Fantastic time, and at a time when everybody and their brother had a show. I mean, Merv Griffin had a show, Mike Douglas had a show, Dinah Shore had a show, Diane Carroll, Woody Woodbury. I mean, if you ever had been on television once in your life, they gave you a show. Plus all the rock shows, uh, Lloyd Thaxton and Sam Riddle locally in California, and in the East Coast you had Clay Cole, and then you had the Gitter with the Heater, and you had Upbeat and, and Jeff Kutash dancers in Cleveland. I mean, everywhere you look, there was rock and roll happening on television. It was a fantastic time. Um, what was interesting, and it still holds true, is that even though all these groups were around and all these seemingly small labels, by the time they got to their second or third record, they had all moved on to a larger label for the most part. And the guys that ran those four labels back then, all those years ago, they're still running the same four labels now. So as much as you think the business has changed and indies have come in and young kids can start up and do their thing on the internet, yeah, that's true. But the minute you get successful on the internet clive owns you yeah. <laughs> so it really doesn't matter i know uh, you like myself were you know just mesmerized by television and stuff like that certainly that sullivan show was the was was the show that seemed to be the holy grail of by god we made it if it wasn't the tonight show and you guys were on that a number of times and we've talked to other folks about their experiences on the ed sullivan show live uh, you know live sunday night i, I think the what the uh, the routine was to rehearse during the week, so you had a real week to get together. What what were your experiences like on uh, on that uh, on that show, Howard? Uh, the first time, I mean, you're right, man. It was certainly the Holy Grail. Uh, you knew it was the Holy Grail because it was the show you watched with your parents before you made it, no matter who you were or where you were. So to be on the Sullivan Show, that meant you were as big as the Beatles, at least for a minute. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a great place to be. And if you didn't make the Sullivan Show, that meant that you were never going to be that guy. You were never going to be as big as the Beatles. And that was a harrowing place to be, I suppose, in the 60s. We were very, very lucky. The first time we did the Ed Sullivan Show, I was really, really nervous, i got to tell you. And... Uh, and there were so many rehearsals. There was so much during the week camera blocking and stuff under the hot lights of the old television show um, formats. It was just incredible. And so many run-throughs for sound because it was a show where I was at least singing live. It may have been to track, but I was singing live. So regardless of what everybody else in the band could get away with, camera-wise, blocking-wise, costume-wise, what Mark was going to do, the clowning around, the ramps that were needed, the stairs, all of that crap. Every time there was a run-through, yours truly had to sing live. Oh. And I didn't realize during the course of the week the toll that would take on my voice. But the night before the, that Ed Sullivan show, I was really, really hoarse. I was in really bad shape, and I was really, really nervous. And I thought, my God, I'm never going to be able to get enough sleep mm. to to do this thing without blowing my voice out on national television in front of my mom. And I remember that being one of the scariest things that ever happened. And as I floated off to sleep that night, uh, that was the last thing on my mind and the first thing that I remembered when I woke up thinking, hey, 
I'm okay. This is going to be okay. And in fact, it was such fun. It felt so natural. Uh, discounting Ed and his non-presence on set because they literally wheeled him in 20 minutes before the show and stood him up against a wall. Um, the staff was so great. The people were so cool. And that theater was so excellent. It was so nice not to be at the big, cold, black CBS tower, but instead in this nice theater. It was really pretty. It was special. It, it felt special. It felt like you had arrived if you had had any fears. The minute those curtains opened up and you realized where you were and the strata to which you had gotten yourself, it was an incredible feeling of accomplishment. And, uh, and I think that little boost of adrenaline helped everybody that ever did that show be just a little bit better. I think if you watch the Sullivan shows, you're going to see some of the best live performances of the 60s on that show because you were on your best behavior, man. Mm -hmm. No matter who you were, Mick Jagger or not, your mom was watching. <laughs> you get off the stage, you realize, I just did that in front of millions of viewers and then probably the most popular show going. Your parents have seen you, and for a second, you're as big as the Bolshoi or Steve and Edie Gourmet. Or the guy that spins plates. There you go. The chimps. <laughs> and we follow those Adelaide chimps, man. Not only there, but uh, in the, at the Steel Pier too in New Jersey. And uh, not an easy act to follow, man. Not not the not the most fragrant act to follow. <laughs> sure. well, there's the chimps and the turtles. They yeah. thought you were both animal there acts. You go. Uh, we've uh, we've worked a lot of zoos. <laughs> As you can imagine, with the monkeys, we've worked a lot of zoos. Oh, man. You know, talk about, you know, the follow-up to you or the, the follow-up after you have such a, a monster hit with uh, Happy Together and stuff. And you, you did. You came back with some other hits. But the, the really neat story is the, the record company just on your guys' case to, hey, we want another Happy Together. And I love the, the story of Eleanor because that was something that you kind of just went off and said, screw it, I'll show them. I'll just... Uh, put together this inane song that has got no, <laughs> no chance of going anywhere. Tell, can you tell us the story of, of Eleanor and how kind of the angst from, uh, you know, Happy Together and having that ram down your throat just led to that super hit for what, you? You know, what, what the hell is wrong with people? Yeah. You know, can't they be happy with success? If you get it one time out of the box, okay. Right. If you get it two times out of the box, that's wonderful. We gave them... Hit after hit after hit following Happy Together, literally. I mean, four hits, five hits, six hits in a row. And yet they were looking for something just a little bit more because number five wasn't good enough for them. If it wasn't a number one record, then something was wrong. And I got so sick and tired of hearing about Happy Together and the success of Happy Together. Bonner and Gordon, the songwriting team, had long dissolved. They were gone. They weren't writing together anymore. Who was going to write the next Happy Together? So I locked myself in a room in Chicago at the Astor Tower Hotel. And I just said, all right, you bastards. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, you know, I, I just threw caution to the wind. And I just decided I was going to write them the most hideous, cliché, <laughs> teenage, rotten song I could to show them that just because it sounds like Happy Together doesn't mean it's going to be a hit record. And here's why. And I, I threw together the most innocuous, inane, teenage hyperbola that I possibly could. I mean, it was to the point of disturbing your folks hate me and pride and joy, etc. And, and I mean, just I really think you're groovy. And I mean, just things that, you know, a 14-year-old wouldn't say let alone a guy in his 20s or 30s, and who is going to buy it? And it's so stupid. And let me write the song. Oh, I know. Eleanor Rigby was just a big hit. Right. I'll call it Eleanor because I can rhyme it easily, but I won't spell it the same. I'll spell it, oh, I don't know, European or something. It won't matter. They're going to return this anyway, and they're going to be really pissed off. I spent the company money to record this little demo. But I, I went into my room, and I wrote this song, and every time Happy to Get the chords went up, I went down. Every, other, every time the little song took a turn to the left, I took a blacker turn and went to the right. And I thought, oh. this is going to be so warped. And I sent it. I did Before I even sent it to him, I played it for the guys in the band thinking, oh, these guys are going to crack up. This is going to be incredible. They're going to be right with me. They're going to go, okay, man, let's stick it to these guys. Let's show them what we're made of. And I played it for the band, hoping to get big laughs. 
and nobody laughed. <laughs> nobody laughed. In fact, our bass player, Chip Douglas, said, oh, my God, what a hit. <laughs> what? No, 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 no. Let me sing you these words one more time. Can you look at these words. Look at these words. You see what it says here? You see what it says? Et cetera, et cetera. Nobody rhymes anything with et cetera. Nobody, you see what I did here? Uh, yeah, but you don't understand. That's exactly what they want. It's snarky and it's tongue-in-cheek and it sounds like, what do you mean, man? Don't do this to me. No, no, no. I hear it in my head. I know exactly what. And so we went in and we made this demo and they freaked out and they said this is the song we've been waiting for <laughs> we went in we cut the thing it was our biggest international record by far covered by so many acts in mm. so many countries that you cannot believe it and uh, I, I get my biggest checks from Italy mm. these days because it's wow. vaguely Neapolitan in sound and uh, the guy who covered it there Gianna Miranda is a huge star and uh, had a big hit with it and I don't even know what the hell it means <laughs> <laughs> I just know that uh Lyra's work in American banks. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. The turtles' reign comes to to an end. You guys uh, finally break up, and I'm, I'm again fascinated by the relationship between you and Mark. I mean, you had opportunities. Um, you're, I think, the, the grand old age of 23. You guys have hit the, you know, you've hit the height of uh, of popdom in music, and all of a sudden you're 23 years old, and and, and what's next? You had offers to go back in and work just by yourself they didn't necessarily want mark but somewhere in your mind you said hey i want this lunatic with me wherever we go and i just thought that was that was fascinating that you guys saddled your wagons together a little bit there well it could have been a losing fight sir i mean it was a a not so calculated risk uh we didn't know what the hell we were doing quite frankly and uh when I got a phone call uh, from Donald Fagan, uh, and this was the stupidest call I ever got anyway, so I really <laughs> didn't take it quite as seriously as he did. But when he said, I don't like my voice, I want a lead singer for Steely Dan. <sighs> what? <laughs> Donald? What? Come on, man. You know, start start looking in the mirror, start figuring out what your strong points are. We had sung on their demo record a little song called Everyone's Gone to the Movies, got them their recording deal. And, uh, and they thought we were good luck or something, but they had no idea what they had within their own group. They had no idea how good Donald was. And uh, I was flattered, but, you know, we're a team, man. We did this as a team, Mark and me, since high school. And if you don't have room for the team, I can't do it. Plus, Mike, you know, like it was jazz. Mm. I mean, really? Right. What? <laughs> And I thought, uh, really, we were not up to the task of, uh, of singing and swinging the way he wanted to. Uh, later, we would learn more complex work than that with Frank. But uh, at the time, it seemed in insurmountable, really. And you and Mark have also provided backing vocals on over 100 albums from some very noteworthy artists. Tell us about some of those collaborations that really stand out in your mind and tell us why you think that you were so often the voices of choice by all these great artists. Well, it started out uh, when we were in London. The first time we went over to rehearse the 200 Motels uh, movie with Frank. Um, in fact, even before that, on our very, very, very first tour of Europe, uh, it had begun. Um, and this had been like weeks after the Turtles had broken up and we had joined Frank Zappa. He had heard the band had broken up and said, well, we're going to make a movie, going to Europe, want to be in the Mothers. Hell yeah, because <laughs> we had nothing else. And and we said, certainly, and we learned this very, very complex music, went over to England. Uh, weeks before, we had met this guy in a little band, a duo called Tyrannosaurus Rex, mm. in Detroit at the Grand A Ballroom, in fact. And uh, he had opened for us, and we had known his music uh, through another fluke. Uh, this couple in New York had played his music for us, and we, we were fans, and he was shocked to find out that anybody in America knew who he was, let alone people who he knew, mm -hmm. and invited us to look him up when we got to England, if that ever happened. And about three months later, it did, and we went down uh, during uh, High Street, uh, Saturday afternoon at the marketplace where he was reported to live, and we started yelling his name, and little Elfin Mark Boland stuck his head out the window and said, My God, boys, what are you doing here? And we said, Mark, we came to party. 
So he asked us up to his room, and uh, we had uh, tea, and then we had some tea. And <laughs> then he said, I'm going to be making a record. Are you guys going to be around? And in fact, um, Bowman wasn't. I don't know where he went. But the next day, I wound up singing on a, singing on a T-Rex song called um, 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 Seagull Woman. And then another one called uh, Hot Love. And uh, we wound up later, the two of us singing on Bang a Gong and a bunch of incredible T-Rex records as he went into electric music and became a punk warrior and all that other great glam stuff. And I was so glad to be along for the ride because I love that guy. You mentioned Frank Zappa, and of course, um, I remember Zappa very well from listening to all those kind of concept albums that he had. And the thing that surprised me as I read this book, um, Howard, was I had always just assumed that you know he was uh, artificially um, fueled. You know, I figured he had to Are be you to be kidding, <laughs> to sir? be on this Are stuff. You yeah. kidding? But but you said really? that you guys were far more artificially uh, enhanced. Fueled, enhanced than he was, <laughs> right? Frank was never the guy to do any sort of drugs or even alcohol at all in in quantity. He was a firm believer in the uh, normal mind, as am I, but there are certain um, (laughs) limitations he put on it that I don't. Uh, He was very, very strict about his rules, and Mark and I were never that strict. So it seemed to me, and to Mark as well, that if we could do Frank's material and he could test us on it, it didn't really matter what our states of mind were. And we put that to the test very early on in our time with the mothers when he came around one day saying, what's that smell? And we said, come on, Frank. And he said, no, 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 my music is very intricate. And uh, if you forgot what we learned yesterday, then this is all a waste of time. And we said, test us. And he did. And he constantly did. And it was a great thing for us because we needed the discipline. Coming from the Turtles, we were a very loose band. We made our own rules, and Mark and I were uh, de facto leaders of the band. So having a guy above us like Frank, a father figure, was really, really great for us. And a little military, but we needed it. Another thing that had to be huge in and around your music and performing had to be just the era, the mid to late 60s and the early 70s, quite a turbulent time. How did that relate just to your lifestyle in general and performing and creating music? Well... Turbulence, as in politics, uh, made more of a difference off stage, I guess, than it did on, except when you were in the mothers. And then everything you did on stage was taken to be some sort of a social comment, whether it was or wasn't. And sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Uh, and Frank would try to tell that to people who would not buy it because he was Frank Zappa. So if he said this, it meant that. And often it didn't. When Frank wrote a song about a flat, that floating sofa, a tongue twister to this day, he meant it to be about a fat floating sofa. It wasn't supposed to represent anything but a couch. And when the German people tried to put a, uh, a political face on it and call Frank the leader of the new rebellion because he had written this piece of music, obviously about the rise of the proletariat class or whatever the hell they were thinking, you know, Frank would always do a press conference and say, what is wrong with you people? I wrote it about a couch. You know, it was very, very frustrating politically to be around that guy. For me and my own politics, I never gave a rat's ass and I still don't really care. And politics is something that I don't like talking about, like religion. It's so unique and personal to everybody that it really doesn't play much of a part. You know, the biggest part it ever played in our career was the White House, and that wasn't politics. <laughs> As you proved. Yeah, great story it there, wasn't, too. <laughs> it wasn't. Well, it wasn't even then, because it was invitation, you know, and you just do it because you're an American. Sure. You know, you mentioned John Lennon before and, and kind of the rocky uh, introduction that you had, but I know you had an opportunity, you and Mark, to, to work with him. And there was another side to John, too, wasn't there? A, a side that uh, he was a, a caring person as well, and I'm sure you probably saw that side, too, right? I saw it. You know, I, I did see it. I saw it when he was with Yoko, but even then, I got to tell you, man, and I know that I'm going to get flack for this, but I got to tell you, and I'm only coming to realize this, I think, in the last few years. But every time I saw John, and the times were few and far between, but every time I saw him, there was always 
a little something negative he threw into the mix mm. just to make sure that it wasn't always good. I mean, my memories of John are, yes, peace and love and war is over and Merry Christmas and all of that stuff. But underneath, there was always a little bit of snark. Underneath, John was always the guy who would stick his foot out so you would trip on the way out of the room just to see how you would handle it, you know? And I'm not saying he wasn't a beautiful man. Mm -hmm. I thought he was the most beautiful man of his time. But uh, in hindsight, he was a very mischievous boy. And uh, he did some stuff that I really don't approve of, uh, particularly with regard to my pal, Harry Nelson, Mm -hmm. who I think got a raw deal from John, literally, and other people who he just sort of um, made mincemeat of. Uh, I I don't like that about people. I don't like people that do that. You know, that's... um, that's kind of sadistic, isn't it? Yeah, it is. You're right. Uh, exactly. Uh, you mentioned Harry, and certainly one of the underappreciated talents uh, ever. Uh, we uh, spotlighted him a couple of weeks ago, and he's one of those guys that he wrote songs that you didn't even really uh, know that he wrote. Certainly had the wild side to him, but again, uh, like you said, a guy that was really misunderstood in a lot of ways. He was misunderstood, and a lot of his wild side was brought out by John. <laughs> he tried so hard to impress John. He wanted to be John. John's best friend so bad. And John was the guy who got him into these screaming contests at the end of Harry's Mm -hmm. career where John could handle it, but Harry could not. Mm -hmm. And with all the drugs and the liquor that John put before him, they would have these screaming contests. John had been into scream therapy, so he knew how to do this. And Harry just sort of blew his voice raw, Mm -hmm. and it never came back. And John wanted the rawness for that Pussycats album he produced with Harry, but But it never went away. I mean, Harry could never get his voice back, and it was the saddest thing in the world. John could go right back to singing like an angel, and with Harry, uh, John just took it a step too far. The contests, you know, the singing competitions, the screaming competitions between them got to be too much, and Harry was a lightweight. And he went under trying to please his idol. I know you're part of the uh, the Happy Together tour. Obviously, a big part you and you and Mark, and uh, you've come to our area up here in Michigan, and you're going to be coming in, in August. I think you're touring with uh, Gary Lewis, uh, Gary Puckett, Mark's going to be there. Mark yeah. Lindsay, uh-huh. Mark, Chuck Negron of Three Dog Night, and Mickey Dolenz has been with you in the past. Just uh, the list goes on and on. It's almost got to be like a class reunion, I would think, for you guys getting back together and telling the old stories and all and reliving all that stuff. It's a hell of a hoot. I'm not <laughs> sure that. Any of us remember the old story, <laughs> but uh, it's a hell of a hoot to sit around with those guys because these are the guys we grew up with. These are the guys from the 60s. These are the real, authentic voices. This isn't one of those tours where it's kind of like, you know, here's the bass player from Iron Butterfly. <laughs> here's the guy who used to play drums with the guy who used to know the girl in the cow hill. <laughs> Come on, give me a break. You know, and it's wonderful to have tribute bands out there. I'm not knocking it. If you have a tribute Doors band or something, Crystal Ship, or God knows what you call yourselves, bless your hearts. Long life to you all. But really, man, if you're going to go out and, and use the name of these bands, you had better be the sound of those bands. Otherwise, boo! I'm the first one to stand on the sideline and go, boo! You're not the guy. In the case of the Happy Together Tour, it's an instant stamp of approval. We've been doing this thing now for a whole bunch of years, and we've come back to your towns a whole bunch of times. So in our case, you pretty much know, first of all, it's us. If you can get past the fact that the two of us are going to be there, you're already more than 20% home. Now you've just got the four other acts to deal with, and I think they're all stellar. So... I don't, I don't see how you guys can go wrong, really, because Gary Lewis is incredible. He's had so many hit records, and his voice sounds just like it did then. If you loved him, then you're going to love him now. He looks the same. He's unbelievable. It's Gary Lewis. It's fantastic. I don't know what to tell you. Mark Lindsay is in better shape than he was 30 years ago. There is not an ounce of fat on that guy. You cannot believe the diet he sticks to on the road. You can't believe the exercise regimen he puts himself through. He's got abs o steel. He's unbelievable up there, and his vocal range is fantastic. He's brilliant, 
and the hits sound like everything great that Paul Revere wishes he could do now and certainly can't without Mark. Gary Puckett is Gary Puckett. Mm -hmm. What can you say about Gary Puckett? I mean, young girl can only be sung by that guy without being arrested. (laughs) And I don't know why he isn't arrested on a nightly basis for singing it because he's way pervier now than he was. (laughs) The only thing he got rid of, much to his credit, is the red leather jumpsuit. You know, he doesn't wear that anymore. That's still hanging in the back of some tour bus someplace that nobody will ever go in. I it's under one of those God, seats that most... you slept under. <laughs> yes, footies, footies. That's right. It's the most foul-smelling thing you have ever seen in your life. I'm sure it's got stains from hell in all the wrong places. And can I just say that Chuck Negron is one of the most underrated voices that has ever been on the planet. It's hard to picture what Three Dog Night, the band, would have been like without him in it. Oh, wait, I guess you can see them, and they're called Three Dog Night. Oh, yeah, and they can't really do any of those songs because Chuck sang them. So if you really want to hear the guy, you got to see our tour. It's really, really great. Even the merchandise, it's fun. It's stupid. It's ridiculous. It's two and a half hours you won't forget, and I guarantee you a good time or your money back. Find me, and I'll pay you personally. The tour comes all over the U.S. this year, and you're coming to our neck of the woods at the Little River Casino on August 30th. I would certainly implore people to buy early because that show sells out yeah. everywhere it goes, and at, yeah. it's been at Little River before. They sell out very early, and of course, you have tens of millions of fans all over the world. Howard Kalen, uh, appreciate having you on the show today, taking so much time with us, and he's written the book that gives the final word on six legendary rock and roll myths. It's called Shell Shock, My Life with the Turtles, Flo and Eddie, and Frank Zappa, etc. Available at Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, and Thank other you. fine book retailers. And of course, you have even more fans now that people have actually heard your story. Yeah. And uh, uh, You guys, I really, really appreciate it. Oh, wait, one more thing. Rick? Yes. (laughs) Say hi to Mick for me. (laughs) I will. He'll visit you at howardkalen.com, and of course, we all know, so says Kalen. Okay, you're right. You guys are the guys, man. They need you. You don't need them. We do radio like the 60s, the stuff we grew up with. I mean, it's all request stuff, old-fashioned contests. You you don't worry about things like playlists and program directors. We really don't. We are so underground. They'd love to throw us off the air but they can't because uh, the ratings are that good. That's so, right. That's, so that's a good problem wow, to have. Man. Yep. Well, listen, there's a place for you guys on the Internet or satellite or someplace else as soon as your PD hears this very tape that's running two track now. I would I would uh, bulk erase this thing before I even transferred it just to make sure. <laughs> You know what we used to do on the radio? I'd add like 10 seconds, 20 seconds of it. Uh-huh. When I get bored, I'd just stop it. i just stop the damn record and say, that's it. <laughs> yes. You've heard it. What the hell? <laughs> I mean, actually, it was my contention, and you can quote me on this, but really, uh, you know, and I even said, you know, once you've heard, hey, hey, Paula, that's it, man. <laughs> right. <laughs> you, take from there, you take the damn thing off. It's not going to get better. It really, really isn't. And it's, and right. And you know, really, really. And if you treat all of America like it had ADD, yeah. then you'll be in good shape. 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 Then you'll be in good shape.